Here's Mitt Romney trying to figure out the name of that thing that we Americans call a donut. Tonight concludes the longest and wildest campaign in our history. And the colors of the electoral map may be changing dramatically before our eyes as some traditionally red states turn blue. All the twists and turns that have been the hallmarks of this campaign. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. This morning, I learned that the Israeli army has launched a major military operation against Gaza, dubbed Pillar of Defense. Israeli aircraft struck dozens of targets throughout the Gaza Strip, killing a top Hamas military leader. And as of we know, this afternoon, seven were dead, two of which were children. Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood has condemned Israel's aggressive response to Hamas rockets, threatening to pull the Egyptian ambassador from Israel. The Muslim Brotherhood's political wing, the FJP, said in a statement that Israel's return to the policy of assignation of leaders from the Palestinian struggle groups shows that the Israeli occupation wants to drag the region toward instability. The statement adds that the occupying state has to understand that the changes the Arab region, and especially Egypt, have witnessed will not permit that the Palestinian people be put under the hold of the Israeli offense in the same way as in the past. What's perhaps most troubling is the deafening silence from the Obama administration. Just today, Obama gave his first press conference since being re-elected, where he touched upon a whole array of global issues. Yet unsurprisingly, there was no mention of the declaration of war against America's closest ally in the Middle East. Unsurprising because it goes without saying that Israel will respond with full military force, and they'll come out just fine. Look, guys, it's clear that neither side is totally innocent here, but there's one thing I want you to consider. The Gaza Strip exists under a complete controlled occupation by Israel. The region is an open-air prison where daily life is a constant struggle for dignity. Israel bombing Gaza is like shooting fish in a bucket. And the citizens of Gaza are open-air targets with literally no place where they can evacuate to. The current administration won't stand up for this injustice. It's up to us to do it. So let's break the set. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. As the internet remains one of the last bastions of democracy we have, the government is trying to find even more pretexts to govern it. And the way they do it, well, the same way they're able to pass every other law that erodes our fundamental civil liberties, scare the crap out of us about terrorism. Indeed, in today's world, acts of terror could come not only from a few extremists in suicide vests, but from a few keystrokes on the computer, a weapon of mass disruption. In the not-too-distant future, we anticipate that the cyber threat will pose the number one threat to our country. It is not a matter of if, but when a cyber Pearl Harbor will occur. Yep, you heard that right, a cyber Pearl Harbor. Even though SOPA, PIPA, CISPA have all failed to pass, the government has continued the relentless crusade against Internet freedom, and the White House might not even wait for congressional approval to crack down. Obama just signed a secret directive that enables the military to respond more aggressively to alleged cyber attacks. Once again, it's the same old story. Give us the power to rule over the Internet and trust that we won't take away your freedoms online. So to talk about what this means for internet freedom, I'm joined by RT Web producer Andrew Blake and founder of SSP Blue, Himon Shu Nigam. Thank you so much both for joining me. Yeah. Thanks, Abby. So, hey, Mu, I'll start with you. You're a veteran of cybersecurity. You've worked in the private industry as well as with governments and regulatory bodies. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, drafted in 1985. So it's been a while. Um, a lot of people say this needs to be updated to deal with the current threats. Do you think that the recent government initiatives we've seen are reasonable solutions to the problem? Well, I, I think the way to think about this, and, and it can sound very alarming, you just played a bunch of um, sound, sound bites from different individuals, political leaders, that were very exciting and really grab your attention. But if you think, step back and go inside what's actually happening inside the Beltway where you're located in Washington, D.C., there are a lot, a lot of conversations going on about what is the best solution when it comes to balancing the rights of privacy of an individual, of a citizen in the United States, versus the right for the government. And in, in many ways, 
the, the necessary right for the government to protect its citizens. And I think what you'll see is in these meetings, there's representatives from the private sector, all the folks from the high-tech companies of the world, one of which I worked at, Microsoft previously, News Corporation, in formerly MySpace, we used to have representatives there. So there's all sorts of involvement in the private sector sitting at the table with the government sector. And I have been a former federal prosecutor doing computer crime and online crimes in the past. And have those have had those conversations and one thing that happens when you engage in a dialectic of this sort the back and forth the constant education of both sides ultimately and it may take a while but ultimately you get to a good solution that will work long term because the worst thing we can do is create a short term answer to what appears to be a short term problem and just completely change the course of our future Absolutely. Uh, and we just saw the House was uh, delegating on a bill today, and a, I'm sorry, the Senate, and, and the bill got killed. Uh, Andrew, you know, we just talked about this new Presidential Directive 20. What exactly is that? Um, do you think the government should have this kind of power? Explain a little bit about what that uh, is. Well, the government should have this kind of power on paper because they're already using this power. We know that the Olympic Games program started under Bush in 06 to target the Iranian nuclear facilities. We know that it's been six years and the government's still using uh, Stuxnet and they're still using using flame and they still haven't admitted to it. So we have this new directive that we just got out today. Uh, the Post did a great article on it and it is classified. So we don't really know everything about it. We have people from inside the White House speaking to reporters in Washington saying this is what we've been told, this is what we've seen. And it says that okay, Washington, you can go ahead and you can actually, like I said, be more aggressive. You can go and attack other systems if it means it's going to prevent America from, well, being the victim to what America is already doing to everyone else. So personally, I think it's dangerous. We've already been warning that ever since we've, you know, may or may not have launched these attacks in Iran and perhaps other countries, we're in danger of copycat attacks. You know, everyone in the Congress, close to the intelligence community, has said that. And during today's hearings on the Senate, uh, Senator Feinstein, I believe, actually said that, oh, I can't talk about it because it's classified, but no, we are under attack. So. It's kind of good that they finally put this on paper. They've actually outlined how they can proceed, but it's just one more step of how the president's going to go ahead, cut corners, do things without the rest of the, the legislative body actually knowing. Sure. Uh, hey, Mu, what do you say to people who say, um, I'm not doing anything wrong, um, I don't have anything to worry about on the internet? Who, I mean, doesn't the entire argument negate our reasonable expectation of privacy here? I mean, should we be worried about having privacy online, or is it kind of just uh, null and void at this point? Well, no, you, you actually hear that from a lot of people out there who will say, well, you know what, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why does it matter? But the reality is, if we're going to be living in the society that we live in, which is grounded on freedom of expression, grounded on privacy, has a history of those issues being a problem from many, many hundreds of years ago, if we want to live in that society, then whether or not somebody is doing something wrong shouldn't be the core focus of the debate. The debate needs to be in a good society, with good citizens that we're assuming want to do the right thing, what kinds of laws can we put in place that protect the right to exist as we do in our society today versus the government's right to protect us, for that matter, from other forces out there, whether it's, whether it's cyber attacks from a foreign, uh, foreign power that's anti-United States, or whether it's even an internal threat from internal forces coming from organized crime or other types of criminals. And I think just reacting to what Andrew was saying, that is a great thing to note. I mean, people are saying, well, there are cyber attacks. I mean, having been in this world for over 15 years now, cyber attacks from foreign governments have been hitting the United States for many years. It is, the par it is part of what happens with the Department of Defense, with the Central Intelligence Agency, with other government agencies. It is not a new thing. What is new is that more people are getting into it, more governments, hostile nation states are using it, and I think if the U.S. government doesn't focus on how they're going to react and how they're going to use it proactively, then it's just like saying we, we want to be ready for war, but we're not going to have any missiles sure. in our defense systems because we decided not to. Sure, but uh, hey, Moon, I mean, you can look at the U.S. government is the one who pretty much has launched a full-scale cyber attack against Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, Stuxnet, now the blueprint for, for this is mapped out online. I mean, Andrew, what do you think it does to have this rhetoric, this really strong rhetoric that we're going to full out, you know, have military aggression towards cyber attacks on our country? 
country, but then kind of boasting and bragging about these these attacks on other countries. Well, let's let's be clear here. I mean, it's been six years since this Olympic Games operation came out, and it's only been less than six months since the New York Times fully exposed the you know, Obama administration officials confirming, oh yeah, we did this. We had the ability to destroy their facilities, and we've ramped it up, and we've been working on it. But on the record, the White House has not said that they've actually done anything. They've warned that if they are to attack, they will be attacked back. They have warned that uh, they are being attacked. They have warned that it's inevitable. There is a cyber Pearl Harbor. There is a cyber 9-11. There is a cyber, I guess those are the two big ones, right? Yeah, so <laughs> things, are, things are bad. They keep telling us that. It's right. really, really bad. It's really, really bad. Think people are going to get back to us. But they're going to, it seems like, every effort imaginable to refrain from actually taking the blame and admitting that they're doing this. So it's kind of disgusting, but at the same time, it's, I would expect nothing less. And you know, the right. second that they come out there you and know. finally actually say, this is what we've been doing, uh, that's probably when those attacks that we keep getting threatened with, the ones that Feinstein says they're coming, the ones that the Congress and Senate are saying, oh no, we have this top secret intelligence saying that we're being hit. That's when it's not going to be top secret anymore. That's when the power grid's actually going to go down. Uh, so, hey, Moon, you, you have about one minute. Says, Absolutely. You have okay, about one minute. Real all right, real quick, just in, in what Andrew was talking about on, on Stuxnet, which a lot of people I don't think are aware of, but it is something that I think your viewers will care about. Stuxnet, Stuxnet is actually designed to prevent collateral damage. So in a, in a strangest kind of way, and I'm not speaking for the administration for sure right now, but in the strangest kind of way, th this is a cyber attack that was testing whether or not you could ast attack a foreign nation state um, in a way that doesn't create collateral damage. If you take that in the physical world, it's like saying, let's, let's have a drone shoot a missile, but it's not going to kill any civilians. That's really what I think the testing is happening around, which in a, in a, from a po from the positive of that is there is a definite effort to attack a government and take down a government grid without actually hurting the citizen who's, who would otherwise be considered collateral damage. Sure, but so there's always collateral damage with really the Chevron. We, you know, yeah, we just found out last week yeah, that Chevron absolutely. was infected. So there's always <laughs> a backlash in some regard. Thank you so much, uh, Hey Mu and Andrew Blake, for coming on course, Breaking It Down. You. Thanks a lot, Amy. So if you like what you see so far, go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash breaking the set and subscribe. Check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash breaking the set. Follow me on Twitter at Abby Martin. I'm going to take a break from my preaching, but stay tuned to hear about our villain and hero of the day next. So today, Nancy Pelosi had a big press conference to make a big announcement that she intends to remain House Minority Leader throughout the next congressional term. But where the press conference got really interesting is when our hero, Luke Russert, asked Pelosi a question. Check it out. Colleagues privately say that your decision to stay on prohibits the party from having a younger leadership and will be hurt and hurts the party in the long term. What's your response? <laughs> Next. So 
So Luke pretty much said Nancy's getting too old to serve. And okay, okay, I get it. You're not supposed to question a woman's age, but that's besides the point. Here's the tweet defending the question. He said, while Pelosi laughed off my question as ageist, many House Dems will privately gripe that it hurts the caucus that all three leaders are 70 plus years old. Now, Pelosi has served since 1987 and has held a power position for 10 of those 25 years. Hmm, 25 years. While it doesn't quite reach the 42 years someone like Muammar Gaddafi was in power, I find it quite interesting how power holders in Washington love to harp on foreign leaders for remaining in power for decades. Here's John McCain, also holding power in Washington for 25 years, on the former Libyan leader. He's a danger to the world. Well, and if the longer he stays in power, the more dangerous he becomes. More dangerous he becomes? Look. All these people should have term limits, and the longer they remain inside the corrupt bubble that is D.C., the less in touch with reality they become. Now, I can go on for hours here, but thank you, Luke Russert. Thanks for standing up for the youth, pointing out a very obvious reality, and reminding everyone how absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that is why Luke Russert is our hero of the day. So if he's the hero, who's the villain? Well, the person taking this highly coveted position is someone who's on a straight-up crusade against gay people in her country of Uganda. Her name is Rebecca Kadaga, and she's the speaker of the Ugandan parliament. So you may not know this, but homosexuality is actually illegal in Uganda. And while that's disturbing enough, Rebecca Kadaga is now championing the effort to pass a bill that would mandate harsher sentences for those convicted for being gay. When the bill was introduced in 2009, the proposal called to broaden the criminalization of same-sex relations by dividing the behavior into two categories. The offense of homosexuality, in which an offender would receive life imprisonment, and aggravated homosexuality, defined to include acts committed by those with HIV or repeat offenders, for which they proposed the death penalty. Now, since introduced, this heinous piece of legislation has been deemed the kill the gays bill and the international community has been up in arms, causing its stagnation for four years. But now, thanks to Kadaga, it has resurfaced without the death penalty clause. Despite the international pressure, Kadaga remains unfazed. Here's what she had to say. If the price of aid is going to be promoting homosexuality in this country, mm -hmm. I think we don't want that aid. Yeah. I don't think we want Kadaga. Here's a little wake-up call. Aid to Uganda would not come with a contingent to promote homosexuality. It just means that the international community looks down upon hate crimes. Not only is she turning a blind eye to human rights activists all over the world, Kadaga is saying that she'll do everything in her power to get this bill passed before Christmas. She said Ugandans want that law as a Christmas gift. They have asked for it, and we'll give them that gift. But you know what would be an even better gift? The gift of human dignity human rights for all, because that's what the people of Uganda deserve. They deserve the right to not face life in prison for being who they are. And that's why Rebecca Kadaga, the bigoted and tolerant speaker of Ugandan's parliament, is our villain of the day. On election day, right here on the show, I presented to you the numbers. No, not the numbers of votes, the dollars that bloated the 2012 election campaign. In fact, the news has emerged that this past election year has shattered all previous records of money in any political race. According to the Center for Responsible Politics, an estimated $6 billion was raised. And almost half of that, $2.6 billion, was spent on the race for the White House. But at the same time, only about 0.3% of the entire U.S. population contributed $200 or more. And that means about 930,000 people in the special interest groups they represent accounted for the majority of the cash flow. It's a lot of influence coming from just a few people. But one coalition is seeking an end to that disproportionate influence. Represent Us has just unveiled a new piece of legislation called the American Anti-Corruption Act. So to break down what this act is calling for and how it would actually work, I'm joined by Josh Silver, director of the initiative and CEO of United Republic. Josh, thanks so much for coming on. You bet, Abby. So Josh, uh, this act would essentially transform the way elections are financed. What exactly are you proposing? Can you break down a little bit of the facets of this bill? Sure. Well, yeah, this is a big deal. You know, this is an issue that uh, if you look at the arc of American history, 
It's been very rare that there's been any headway made on controlling the undue influence of moneyed interests in politics. And as you said in the intro, the problem is just epic right now. Six billion dollars projected in the federal elections alone this year, blowing out all the other uh, records. Of course, major donors give 25, 30 million dollars from one person. Um, the founders of the country didn't envision this. What we're doing is presenting legislation, because as you may know, there's been efforts to amend the U.S. Constitution on this issue since the famed or infamous 2010 Citizens United court ruling uh, that has really opened up the floodgates. That's a very high bar. Two-thirds of the U.S. Congress and three-quarters of the states are needed to pass a constitutional amendment. Instead, we're proposing legislation that would do many things. One, it would severely curtail how much money lobbyists can actually give to politicians, down all the way down to $500. It would limit the amount of money that can be given to super PACs uh, to the same amount that's currently uh, for regular PACs, $5,000. Uh, it would it would change the revolving door so that you can no longer have politicians moving right off of Capitol Hill and within one or two years going on to K Street and lobbying. Make it five years or seven years. So these are these are major changes uh, that are are buttressed by probably the biggest provision in the act, which is citizen funded elections, a tax rebate of a hundred dollars per person in the in the United States that can be given to any politician of their choice to offset this huge power of PACs, because the reality is without a constitutional amendment, you can't stop PACs and independent expenditures. You have to try to counterweight them. And then finally, the last part of what we're doing that's really, uh, really revolutionary is we're not introducing it to Congress. First, we're going to get millions of people to become co-sponsors of the act at represent.us on the web. And then once we've got at least a million people we go to Congress, we introduce it with bipartisan support. There were just, there were more Republicans introducing this, this uh, yesterday in our launch than there were Democrats. And then we're going to go after politicians in 2014 and unseat them from office if they won't support the act. So, Josh, you, you said that this is kind of a way of going around Citizens United because that's too much of a pie in the sky kind of ideal here. But I mean, this seems like it's, it's going way beyond Citizens United. I mean, citizen funded elections, this is going straight to the crux of the problem. Do you think that this is, this is setting a higher bar to get millions of people behind this than, than to overturn Citizens United here? Well, absolutely not. I mean, the reality, as anybody who follows politics will tell you, if you're trying to get two thirds of the Congress, and then three quarters of the state legislatures to ratify, that's uh, uh, incredible. Even the Equal Rights Amendment didn't pass when that was attempted a couple decades ago. However, uh, the, the most important point here is that political money is like water, and it finds its way to where it wants to go unless you're absolutely careful to close off every possible way that it's going to get through. And that's what this legislation reflects. It reflects the hard reality that without a major piece of legislation, uh, th then you're, you know, you're, gonna, you're not going to actually fix the problem. You're just going to put a Band-Aid on it. And I think maybe more to your point, what we're going to find here is people are outraged at what's going on. Nearly 90 percent of Americans, liberals, conservatives, moderates, independents, they're all disgusted by this problem of money in politics. It may take a massive scandal to actually see something pass, just like in 1974, right after Watergate. That was the last major campaign finance moment in this country. We may have to set this proposal up so that when that scandal arrives, we'll be ready. Right, right. Uh, well, it seems like there's Watergates going on by the day, Josh. It doesn't seem like anyone's paying attention, but I uh, totally applaud your efforts. Um, and you've gotten a broad coalition of support. I mean, we're talking about the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, Democratic and Republican strategists alike. How did you garner such a broad coalition? Um, and are there any sitting representatives currently on board? Yeah, good questions all. First of all, no, nobody on nobody in Congress is on board because we don't want them yet. You know, if you introduce this uh, and start asking members of Congress to start getting behind this, what's going to happen? This is going to become Senator so-and-so's bill or Congressperson so-and-so, and then boom, you fall prey to the partisan gridlock that already exists. Oh, are Republicans backing that? Democrats don't want to touch it. No, this is the people's bill. And the reason why such a broad array of people are behind it, as you mentioned, we've got someone from the Tea Party, a leader from the Tea Party standing next to a leader from Occupy Wall Street. We've got major uh, Republican strategists like Mark McKinnon 
standing next to Democratic strategists and fundraisers like Susan McHugh. At our launch, we had Ted Roosevelt IV, a Republican and great-grandson of the former president, standing next to Richard Painter, who was from the George W. Bush White House, standing next to Larry Lessig, a, a Harvard professor and liberal. And the reason is, is everybody agrees we've got to get money out of politics and that bold measures are needed. And that's what's reflected at this uh, proposal and represent.us if you want to find out more about it. It does seem like America is unique in the sense that we are just pouring billions and billions upon billions of dollars. Every election, it gets worse, Josh. You've said yourself, Congress is too broken to fix itself. So it's up to us, the American people, to lead reform as citizen co-sponsors and force Congress to follow us. I mean, it's an extremely noble idea. And indeed, that's the way the government should be. But I mean, looking realistic, realistically here, the election just ended. This is just gearing up toward, like you said, 2014, 2016. I mean, we, the only thing that we can really do is put pressure on our elected representatives to sign this. And if not, we need to boot them out, right? Yeah. And, and remember, let's not forget, there's two really important things to remember. Everybody who's watching this right now, you've got issues you care about, whether it's reducing the debt so that the priorities that you care about are, 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 are paid attention to by government. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's health care. Maybe it's taxation. Whatever it is, those issues are getting blocked, hindered, skewed. They're being uh, derailed by big money in politics. It happens all the time. It's why the banks are stu still too big to fail. Uh, it's, it's why we're seeing so many sort of really question mark uh, decisions made by the Congress, the gridlock, the 11 percent approval rating of Congress, which is at historic lows. And if you're going to make progress on any of these issues you care about, we've got to deal with this issue of money in politics. And we have to remember that the arc of history is long. Remember, it was not until 1907 that the very first campaign finance laws were passed by Teddy Roosevelt. 1947 was the next wave. Then all the way until 1974, when Watergate hit, we saw modern campaign finance rules ch uh, change. It hasn't been since 1974 that we've seen progress in this area. It is time, it, Josh, unfortunately we're out of time. It is time to get that bold reform. I think everyone can agree all across the board, which is uh, I applaud your efforts. I hope that people sign on, really pay attention. This is what we need. I think Citizens United has had a lot of people disillusioned with the system, and this is the answer. Josh Silver from United Republic, thank you so much. Thank you. Look, this is probably one of the most important initiatives happening across the country right now. And it's happening with bipartisan support, which is that exactly what needs to happen if we want to see anything get done in this corrupt to the core government system. The elected representatives we choose to represent us don't want to sign on to ending the bribery, then it's up to us to hold them accountable.